Good morning. Previously, we discussed the effects the drag force has on an object in freefall. Today, we are going to use calculus to actually derive the equations of motion for an object with an initial velocity of zero and a drag force acting on it. It looks like this in real speed. At 40 times slower than real speed, you can see the dodgeball starts with an initial velocity of zero and, as it falls, the drag force acts up on the ball. The force of gravity acts down on the ball, and realize I have exaggerated the magnitude of the drag force in the free body diagram. If I drew it to be proportionally correct relative to the force of gravity, it would be too small to see on the screen. Let's use the drag force equation, which has the drag force literally proportional to velocity. Drag force equals the negative of the proportionality constant times velocity. Defining down as positive, Bobby, please determine the terminal velocity of the dodgeball. Flippin' physics. Down is positive. Determine the terminal velocity of the ball. But this dodgeball does not reach terminal velocity, right, Mr. P? Okay, so yeah, the, the dodgeball in this demonstration does not get close to its terminal velocity. However, it is going to be helpful later in our equation derivations to have the equation for the maximum speed the ball could attain, or terminal velocity. Bobby? Let's use Newton's second law. The net force in the y direction equals, well, we defined down as positive, so positive force of gravity minus drag force, and that all equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. At the maximum velocity or terminal velocity, the acceleration of the ball reaches zero, so the drag force equals the force of gravity. We can substitute in proportionality constant times terminal velocity for drag force and mass times acceleration due to gravity for force of gravity. That means terminal velocity equals mass times acceleration due to gravity over the proportionality constant. What happens to the negative in the drag force equation? Oh. That negative gives the direction of the drag force. By drawing the free body diagram and identifying the drag force to be in the negative y direction, we have already identified the direction of the drag force and do not need to include that negative. Yeah, and that is called deja vu. Thank you, Bobby. Now we are going to use that same equation to determine the velocity of the ball as a function of time. However, rather than looking at what happens when the acceleration reaches zero, we are going to substitute the derivative of velocity with respect to time in for acceleration. Now we have a differential equation we can use to solve for velocity. We just need to do the math. Right. Here we go. Divide the whole equation by mass and put the derivative of velocity with respect to time on the left side of the equation. Then divide the whole equation by acceleration due to gravity minus proportionality constant times velocity divided by mass and multiply through by dt. Now we have dv on the left hand side with all the variables that have velocity in them and dt by itself on the right hand side. Now we can take the integral of both sides of the equation. On the left hand side we are taking the integral with respect to velocity. On the right-hand side, we are taking the integral with respect to time. Let's use a definite integral because we know the initial velocity equals zero. It starts from rest. And let's let the final velocity equal v. Let's set the initial time equal to zero and the final time equal to t. That way, we are solving for velocity v as a function of time t. Okay, who has ideas about how to integrate these equations? Well, the integral of dt is just t, so that is easy. Right, but what about that integral with respect to velocity? I, I do not know how to do that. Oh, we use u substitution. I, I love u substitution. Yeah. Uh, let, let u equal the acceleration due to gravity minus proportionality constant times velocity divided by mass. That means du equals, well, the, the constant g has no v in it, so we are left with negative proportionality constant over mass times dv. Solving for dv gives dv equals negative mass over proportionality constant times du. Now we have the integral from 0 to u of 1 over u times the quantity negative mass over proportionality constant all with respect to u. Actually, mass and proportionality constant are constants, so we can take them out from underneath the integral and the negative as well. Actually, I'm not sure you did the limits for u correctly. 
the initial velocity equals zero. So for u initial, we plug in zero for velocity in the expression g minus b times v all over m. And we get that u initial equals g, the acceleration due to gravity, not zero. Right. Thanks, Bo. Uh, but velocity final equals v, so u final does equal u. Yeah. Very nice, Billy, and thank you, Bo. Now we can take the integrals. The integral of 1 over u with respect to u equals the natural log of u. The integral with respect to time equals time, as Bo pointed out. We still have our limits of g, u, 0, and t. However, now we can substitute back into our equation what u is equal to and change those limits again to 0 and v instead of g and u. Bo, please continue from here. All right, let's start with the left side and substitute in the final and initial values. That means we have negative mass over proportionality constant times the quantity. Well, it's, it's final minus initial, so the natural log of acceleration due to gravity minus proportionality constant times. We, we substitute in V there for final velocity, divide by mass, and then minus the natural log of the same thing, only we substitute in zero for the initial velocity. That just works out to be the natural log of the acceleration due to gravity. Oh, <laughs> one of the natural log rules is that the natural log of A minus the natural log of B equals the natural log of A divided by B. That means we can change it to the natural log of the quantity G minus B times V over M, all over G. Uh, let's deal with the right-hand side now. That's just time final minus time initial or time t minus zero or just time t. Thank you, Bo. From there... Actually, now that I think about it... I'm sorry, Mr. P, just a second. That's fine, Bo. Go ahead. We do not need to use u substitution if we do not want to. Going back to the left-hand side of the original integral, we can instead factor out negative proportionality constant over mass in the denominator and then flip that fraction over to put it in the numerator and bring it out from under the integral because negative mass over proportionality constant is constant. We can use the integral rule that the integral of one over x plus a equals the natural log of the absolute value of x plus a to get that this integral equals negative mass over proportionality constant times the natural log of the quantity velocity minus mass times acceleration due to gravity over proportionality constant from zero to v. But that is not the same as what we had before. I know it looks that way right now, but it will be the same soon. Have patience. Okay. Plug in v for the final value and zero for the initial value. Then rearrange the equation, remembering that the natural log of A minus the natural log of B is the same as the natural log of A over B. Now we can factor out negative proportionality constant over mass. And it turns out we get the exact same result for the original integral with respect to velocity as we did before using U substitution. Only this approach means we do not need to use U substitution. That makes sense, Bo. Thanks. Okay, from there, we can multiply the whole equation by negative proportionality constant over mass, and then take e, or Euler's number, to the power of the whole equation because e to the natural log of x is just x. That means we have acceleration due to gravity minus proportionality constant times velocity over mass all over acceleration due to gravity equals e to the power negative proportionality constant times time over mass. Multiply through by acceleration due to gravity, Subtract acceleration due to gravity from both sides and multiply through by negative one. Then multiply the whole equation by mass over proportionality constant. And then we can factor out mass times acceleration due to gravity divided by the proportionality constant. Anybody recognize that? Mass times acceleration due to gravity divided by the proportionality constant? That is the terminal velocity I figured out before. Correct, Bobby. That means the velocity as a function of time for this dodgeball equals terminal velocity times the quantity 1 minus e to the power negative proportionality constant times time divided by mass. Bobby, please show that this equation fits the initial and final conditions we have for velocity. Okay, uh, well, we know the initial velocity of the ball is zero. So if we plug zero in for time, we should get zero for the velocity. 
let's substitute zero in for time in the velocity equation. e to the power of zero equals one, and one minus one equals zero, so it works. The initial velocity for this equation equals zero. We know the final velocity of the ball is the terminal velocity, so if we plug, well, plug in an infinite amount of time for time, we should get the terminal velocity. Substituting infinity in for time, e to the power negative infinity equals zero, so the final velocity does work out to be the terminal velocity. This equation fits the initial and final conditions for the dodgeball. Thank you, Bobby. Now that we have the equation for velocity as a function of time, we can also determine the equation for acceleration as a function of time. Billy, how do you think we should do that? Well, the equation for velocity is velocity as a function of time equals terminal velocity times the quantity 1 minus e to the power of negative proportionality constant times time divided by mass. And we are trying to determine acceleration as a function of time. Actually, it will be a little bit easier if you back up one step and leave mass times acceleration due to gravity over, over proportionality constant in the equation. Sure, but how do we get acceleration from velocity? Acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. Oh, right. right. Correct, Bo. And can you use that to determine the acceleration of the ball as a function of time, please, Bo? Sure. Acceleration equals the derivative of velocity with respect to time. So it equals the derivative of the equation Billy just identified. To make it easier to understand, let's take the derivative of each term in that expression. The derivative of mass times acceleration due to gravity over proportionality constant is zero because all those are constants and do not change with respect to time. We then subtract the derivative of the next term, which equals, well, the derivative of a uh, bunch of constants times e to the power, um... We get to use the chain rule! Oh, right, the chain rule, thanks. But how do we do that? Actually, it's on the AP equation sheet. I oh, always yeah. forget about that. Right. Do not forget that you get an equation sheet on the AP exam, and it has a section of common calculus rules. Right. From the equation sheet, we know the derivative with respect to x of e to the power a times x equals a times e to the power a times x. Yeah, it uses the chain rule. That means the derivative with respect to time of e to the power negative proportionality constant times time over mass equals the derivative with respect to time of what's in the exponent or negative proportionality constant over mass all times e to the power negative proportionality constant times time divided by mass. Plugging that back into our equation, well, mass times acceleration due to gravity over proportionality constant are all constants, so those just remain multiplied by what we just got using the derivative. Mass and proportionality constant cancel out, and we are left with, well, a negative times a negative equals a positive, so... Acceleration as a function of time equals acceleration due to gravity times e to the power of negative proportionality constant times time over mass. Thanks, Bo. Billy, talk about the limits, please. Yeah, uh, at time equals zero, the acceleration works out to be just the acceleration due to gravity. And that makes sense because the initial velocity equals zero, so the initial drag force equals zero. So right at that initial moment, the ball is in free fall and has an acceleration equal to the acceleration due to gravity downward. At time equals infinity, the acceleration works out to be zero. All oh, right, because the ball is moving at terminal velocity, again, not this ball, but a hypothetical one which has enough height to reach terminal velocity, and at terminal velocity, the acceleration of an object equals zero. This equation checks out when we compare it to our limits. Correct, Billy. All right, now let's figure out what the graphs of these two functions look like, starting with acceleration as a function of time. Acceleration equals the constant number little g, or the acceleration due to gravity, times e to the power of negative proportionality constant times time over mass, or because the proportionality constant and mass are constants, it is just e to the power negative constant values times time. To determine what the shape of that curve looks like, recall that y equals e to the power x has a, is a graph that 
way, way over here where x has a large negative value, the curve starts at zero. The curve has a y-intercept of one, is concave up, and has no vertical asymptote. y equals e to the power negative x just flips that curve over the y-axis. Our acceleration is a function of time equation is only valid for times starting at zero, therefore our graph has no values for negative time. Also, rather than starting at one at the initial time of zero, the acceleration starts with a value of g, because the equation is multiplied by g. Therefore, our acceleration is a function of time graph, from time zero to the time it takes to reach 99% of terminal velocity looks like this. The initial acceleration has a value equal to the acceleration due to gravity. Over time, it decreases and asymptotes at zero, and the curve is concave up. But what about the velocity as a function of time graph? Please explain what that will look like. Well, the velocity as a function of time equals the terminal velocity times one minus e to the power negative proportionality constant times time over mass. So, well, the, the shape will be like y equals one minus e to the power negative x. We just graphed e to the negative x. We could think of it as the shape of y equals one plus negative e to the power of negative x. And negative e to the power of negative x is just e to the negative x flipped over the x-axis. If you add y equals one to that, it just shifts the curve up the y-axis by one. So that is the basic shape of the velocity graph. However, it is multiplied by the terminal velocity, so the graph looks like this. The initial velocity is zero, the final velocity asymptotes to the terminal velocity, and the curve is concave down. Very nice, Bo. This graph is from time zero through a time where the velocity reaches 99% of its terminal velocity. All right, lastly, we need to determine position as a function of time. Who has ideas on how to find y position as a function of time for the ball? Uh, yeah. We know velocity equals the derivative of position with respect to time. Okay, so the derivative of position with respect to time equals the equation we got for velocity. How does that help us? I'm not sure. Remember, we can rearrange any derivative to make it into an integral. Okay, sure. That means dy equals that whole expression times dt. And we can take the integral of both sides, the left side with respect to y from 0 to y, and the right side with respect to time from 0 to t. Oh, and the terminal velocity is constant, so that can come out from underneath the integral. This is all great. Bobby, please keep it going. Okay, the integral with respect to y equals y from 0 to y. The integral of 1 minus e to the negative proportionality constant times time over mass equals time minus, well, from the AP equation sheet, we know the integral with respect to x of e to the power a times x equals the inverse of a times e to the power a times x. That means the integral of e to the power negative proportionality constant times time over mass equals negative mass over proportionality constant times e to the power negative proportionality constant times time over mass. We can substitute that into the equation. A, neg a negative times a negative equals a positive. And now we can substitute in our final minus initial limits. On the left-hand side for y, we get y minus zero. On the right-hand side, we get the terminal velocity times the quantity Oh boy, well, we just substitute in t for time in that expression and then subtract substituting in zero for t in that same expression. e to the power of zero equals one. Multiply through by terminal velocity and factor out mass divided by proportionality constant. We get the y position as a function of time for the ball to equal terminal velocity times time plus mass times terminal velocity over proportionality constant times the quantity e to the power negative proportionality constant times time divided by mass, and then minus one. Yeah.
Great, thank you, Bobby. Now, I will substitute mass times acceleration due to gravity divided by proportionality constant back in for terminal velocity into the equation. I think it is good to see the y position equation both with and without terminal velocity in it. The one without terminal velocity has more constants in it, but the one with terminal velocity seems a little bit more straightforward. Bo, we do not have a final condition to check this equation against, however, we do have an initial condition. Could you confirm the initial condition works, please? We set the initial y position to be zero, so this equation should give us y equals zero when we substitute zero in for time. Zero times anything equals zero. E to the power of zero equals one. And one minus one equals zero. So this equation does give an initial y position equal to zero. Thank you, Bo. Now let's look at the graph of position as a function of time. Realize this is the summation of two graphs. Y equals terminal velocity times time. And y equals, well, that whole expression. <laughs> let's start with y equals that whole expression. E to the negative anything starts out at 1, decreases to an asymptote of 0, and is concave up, which is the same shape as the acceleration graph. However, we are subtracting 1 from that. So this expression starts out at 0, decreases to an asymptote of negative 1, and is concave up. To that, we are adding y equals terminal velocity times time. That is the slope intercept form of a line with a slope equal to the terminal velocity and a y-intercept equal to zero. Our equation for y-position of the ball as a function of time equals the addition of those two graphs. So it starts out at zero, ends with a slope equal to the terminal velocity, and is concave up. That is what the graph of y-position as a function of time looks like for our ball, which starts out at time zero with an initial velocity of zero, experiences a drag force, and reaches 99% of its terminal velocity. And remember, we defined down as positive. Thank you very much for learning with me today. I enjoyed learning with you.